Hi, welcome to Italics, the Italian American magazine. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburi. We're here at Montclair State University for the kickoff of the Teresa and Lawrence and Sarah Distinguished Professorship in Italian and Italian American Studies. But first, we're going to bring you an in depth interview with Senator Diane Savino, President of the Italian American State Legislators Caucus of New York. We're here at Italics with Senator Diane Savino. Welcome to Italics. Thank you, Anthony. We would like to introduce you as the new president of the Italian American State Legislators Caucus to, um, to our viewer, viewership. And I guess my first question is, why politics? You started in 2004. You were elected to office in 2004. What makes, uh, what makes someone go into politics? I found that most women in politics are what I refer to as accidental activists. <laughs> um, they are predominantly women in politics come out of the teaching field, the social service field like myself, like yourself, exactly. or community activism. And what propels us to move forward is we either become involved in something um, you know, that uh, triggers our sense of social justice or political justice, and we become very active in it, and the next thing you know, the, the next logical step is politics. And for me, mine started, as I said, I was in the social service field. I was a caseworker. I worked for the city's Child Welfare Administration, and I became very active in the union that represented those workers, partly out of self-interest. I was getting laid off mm. <laughs> in 1991, and then in uh, a few years after that, um, I became very active in the union itself, eventually going to work for the union as a, first an executive board member, then a, a representative at the bargaining table, and eventually taking over the union's political action program. And in 2004, there was a vacancy in the district that I lived in, and the then Senate leader, which is our current governor, David Patterson, called me and asked me if I wanted to run for state senate. And my initial reaction was, how could I run for state senate? And um, and then I realized that um, I had been helping so many other people run for office, running campaigns, running field operations, that I could certainly take that same expertise and put it into my I'll own, race. In your own race. And here I am. Yeah. Your district is northern Staten Island and southern Brooklyn. Is right. That it's correct? the north yeah. and east shores of Staten okay. Island. So it's from the Gothels Bridge to the Verrazano Bridge, mm -hmm. and then including South Beach, and then over the Verrazano Bridge into South Brooklyn. And it's Bensonhurst, it's Bath Beach, Coney Island, mm -hmm. Seagate piece of Bay Ridge, piece of Diker Heights, Borough Park, and Sunset Park. Mm -hmm. It's a very large, diverse, interesting district. With also a large Italian-American population. A very large Italian-American yeah. population. You know, we affectionately refer to Staten Island as Staten Italy because <laughs> we do have the highest concentration of Italian-Americans in any county in the United States. Right. I think something like 40 per 35, 40 percent. It's is even that, higher than is that. Is it higher than that? Really? You, you have to factor in people who are half Italian and half Irish, and mm -hmm. we, have a, we have a lot of those mixed marriages. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And so now here you are for, for, what, your first three or four years, you are in the minority. You're part of the minority Democratic Party in, in uh, in Albany, some, uh, uh, in the minority, as we were talking before, for 70 years with a nine-month uh, uh, reprieve, I guess, at one point or another, about 30-some-odd years ago. Yeah, 1965. 1965. More than, more than 30, 40 years ago. What has it been like the last couple of months up there? Well, first it was the campaign yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, one of the roles I had in the state senate was the co-chair of the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee. And um, so I'm kind of like the Chuck Schumer of <laughs> the state senate, mm -hmm. of the, our state senate anyway, together with Senator Klein and, his, and Senator Antoine Thompson from the Buffalo region. And <clears throat> so my first goal, of course, was to get us into the majority. And we did that on November 4th, but our leadership transition was a little problematic there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but we settled it in time for the Senate to go back into session. It's been chaotic. It's been exciting. It's uh, certainly a change for everybody. It's a, it's a sea change for many people who are used to doing business in Albany. It's a cultural shift for a lot of people. Um, and of course, we're facing the worst financial crisis yeah. the state has ever faced, probably since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So yeah. while it, it's, it was sweet to win, you know, you want to win when there's some money to spend. <laughs> We don't have yeah. any right now. Yeah. But I think that's going to be the real challenge for us. You know, it's, it's easy to um, lead when you don't have to make hard decisions. You know, this year will, sh will uh, be very difficult for a lot of people. But I think that we are going to uh, try and make the changes that we believe is necessary to the New York State government and also find a way to mitigate some of the uh, 
implications in the budget so that we don't necessarily harm people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's going to be the biggest challenge for us. One of my questions I wanted to ask you was, will the gridlock end, whatever gridlock there is? Um, because you're, what is it, 32 to 30? 32 30. to 30. So it's a very slight majority, right? So how, how do you see that? creating uh, gridlock or not creating gridlock or do you think that the 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 financial situation is so bad that people are just going to have to get along well i think to a certain extent they will yeah. um, and i think one of the problems that has happened particularly in the last ten or twelve years in in albany and especially in the state senate is the bitter partisanship that has really affected the way we govern and it's it's easy to paint the opposing party as you know like devil, like mm -hmm. they have horns on their yeah. head, when in fact that's not true. Everybody gets elected or runs for office for the same reason. They want to do something positive for their community, for their, for their neighborhoods, for their neighbors, uh, for their own family. And they may be of a different party and maybe they have a different opinion on some fundamental issues, but essentially we all want to do, we want to accomplish the same thing. And I think the, the one thing that we hope to bring to the state senate is uh, more bipartisanship, opening up um, you know, the opportunity for the members of the minority party who are now the Republicans. You know, we don't have a monopoly on ideas. Mm -hmm. And the, the bulk of our conference actually comes from the downstate region. And we need the support of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle to help us deal with the upstate economy, to deal with the largest industry in New York State, which is not the financial service mm -hmm. industry and not tourism, but agriculture. I mean, there are, we have a farmer in our conference, Daryl Obertine, but there's an expertise that exists um, that our colleagues have that if they want us all to be successful and that should be the underlying goal if we're successful the people of the state of New York are, su are successful we can work together I know that you're a great proponent of the middle class and you yes. recorded recently with regard to the 700 million dollar bailout and how uh, the, the big boys mostly boys and some girls got theirs and now mm -hmm. so we have to make sure that the middle class gets there yeah I mean I think the the real uh, shame of that $700 billion bailout is it did not trickle down to the most needy and the most affected mm -hmm. by the financial meltdown. And that's the middle class, particularly homeowners. I mean, the rapid rise of foreclosure across New York City and across New York State has devastated families, it's devastating communities, it's depressing property value for everybody. And there should have been um, more emphasis on providing direct assistance to affected homeowners and that wasn't there and we hope that with the new administration that that will change he's certainly saying the right things the statement he made i think yesterday mm -hmm. about capping executive pay for banks and companies that receive tremendous you know mm -hmm. bailouts of, of public money is, a, is appropriate and anybody who can't live on a half a million dollars a year you know, I think I think I could adjust to a half a million dollars a year. I think a lot of us could, right. exactly. exactly. And, and the real shame of it, Anthony, is that yeah. we gave them $700 million in an effort to shore up these ailing financial institutions, and they still laid off a, they laid off 100,000 people in New York alone. Mm -hmm. That is outrageous. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully better days are, are on their way. Let's move more towards the theme of, more or less, the general theme of our program, and that is Italian-American culture in general. There are anywhere between 45 and 50 Italian-American legislators currently, depending on how we count and what mm -hmm. names we miss that don't end in right. vowels and things of that sort. Were there some losses? There were some losses, of course. We know that one of our, we're with Queens College. Mm -hmm. One of our greatest supporters over the years has been Senator Maltese. Um, he lost his race to Joseph Adabo. Right. Now, from an ethnic point of view, we sort of feel good about right. it. But, <laughs> we're even. Yeah, but we, we're even out. But have there been other losses, you think, you think from the Italian-American perspective? I don't. I don't the, the one outstanding race yeah. uh, was Senator Padovan and Jim Gennaro. That was finally decided, I believe it was Tuesday, mm -hmm. and Senator Padovan did um, emerge the winner in that. But either way, both Jim Gennaro and Frank Padovan are both Italian, both so Italians, right. I, we, we would have been any right back. Right. Yeah, right. I don't believe we lost any other Italian-American mm -hmm. legislators um, in this cycle. And as you pointed out, we have about 45 to mm -hmm. 50, give or take one or two, because mm -hmm. we do have some that um, don't have an Italian last name, but they are in fact Italian, so sometimes you forget that they're Italian. Yeah. But the Italian-American uh, caucus in the legislature is actually larger than any other caucus, and uh, in fact, I, I don't think that we have over the years used the strength of our numbers to our advantage, and that's one of the things I would really like to focus on, starting with this year's conference. 
And uh, we should say that the conference is an annual conference that the Italian-American legislators have. Um, it is a membership body, mm -hmm. and you are the new president. You were sworn in this year. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. And it's sort of a, it's, it's a transitional year, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, the caucus was inactive for a while, and now instead we're off to a new start. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your uh, plans, some of your hopes, let's say, to get to get things off the ground? Well, well first of all, we have uh, three other officers, Ginny yeah. Fields, who mm -hmm. You know, again, name does not sound Italian, no, but she, in fact, right. is as Italian as you are. Yeah. Um, Joe Griffo, who represents Rome, New York, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Peter Abate, our assemblyman from Brooklyn, who has been an officer, I think, for as long as the conference has, yeah. as he's been in the assembly. So we had our first meeting, and then we followed it up with dinner at an Italian restaurant, as only we should. And we talked about how we could revitalize this conference. And, you know, during the, the break when we weren't in Albany, I made an effort to reach out to various organizations, whether the Sons of Italy, the Federation of Italian American Organizations, the Consulate, yourself, mm -hmm. to talk about what we can do to attract people to come to Albany to participate in this conference and what, what would bring people to Albany? What are they interested in and why aren't they coming? And, you know, I found out some interesting things, some great ideas on what we can include in the conference, whether it will be at the film festival mm -hmm. or some workshops that speak to issues that Italian Americans, particularly right now, are dealing with. I know in my own office, probably because it is Staten Island, I get um, many constituents who approach me on, a, on how to uh, obtain dual citizenship now that they know that it's available to them. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. uh, how, to res how to resolve land disputes in Italy. Apparently that's a very difficult process over there. Yeah. You know, so th we might want to include things like that. Some cultural things, uh, whether it be music related, food related. Um, obviously we all love to eat. Mm -hmm. um, it's maybe a wine tasting or an olive oil tasting. So we want to mix some fun. We want to mix some substantive issues. We want to in reach out to um, a lot of the various colleges that have active Italian American student organizations, see if they would come and maybe participate in a mock um, legislative session, mm -hmm. which is always fun for the students. And really put together something that will be the template then going forward for the conference. Because if we don't do that, you know, we run the risk of the conference becoming irrelevant and just having, you know, every year, everyone comes to Albany for the one event, the Festa the that Festa, we do in Troy. Night, right. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's fun. Mm -hmm. We have a bocce tournament and everybody eats. But that doesn't do much to promote Italian-American culture or to build relationships with Italian-American organizations around New York State and open up the state you know, uh, opportunities in the state government for Italian Americans. Now, the other thing the caucus does, too, is also grant scholarships to students, yes, which we is do. a really good... and we're going to continue yeah. that. And our hope is that if we grow the conference and we attract more sponsors and more supporters and more participants, we'll be able to raise more money, because that's where we raise the money for the scholarships. Mm -hmm. So the more people we have, the more tickets we sell, the more money we'll have for scholarships for young, you know, Italian-Americans. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about representation of Italians in the media. What do we do with, and, and, I, and I have to admit that I'm, I was an, uh, a, a fan of The Sopranos, both as a TV watcher, but also, you know, I had the excuse that it was something I studied as a cultural artifact, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So what do we do with Hillary Clinton Sopranos commercials? It's difficult because I think one of the problems is Italian-Americans themselves yeah. enjoy this image. Yeah. You know, and I think probably historically, you know, it goes back to, you know, the early 19th century, the early 20th century, late 19th century, when the Italians came in great, you know, numbers mm -hmm. from southern Italy, and they lived um, pre predominantly in the Lower East Side, and, you know, won their, their population. I remember my great-grandmother, you know, once she never learned to speak English, she barely, you know, she never learned to read or write, but there was a great distrust for government. It came from her experience in, in the in, sub in, southern, in southern part of Italy. Italy. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, what built up around there is their own system of how to deal with, you know, issues. <laughs> and when I think, you know, my grandmother, who was born in, in the Lower East Side, for her, she, she, didn't, she never had any connection to Italy itself. She had no desire to go. She, she, you know, and my great-grandmother never spoke about Italy in any way, shape, or form. You know, it was as if she got off the boat and she never looked back. And so the experience of Italians in America, or Italian-Americans, mm -hmm. is the one that began in the ghettos of the Lower East Side. And it's, I, perhaps it's, it's, they're familiar with it, they understand it, they get it, and there's a nostalgia that's attached to it, even the portions of that history that are distasteful. 
and because they have no connection to their homeland, really, to their own culture, this has become Italian culture. And I think it's going to be very difficult to change that among people. So we almost enjoy um, the image that is portrayed that we're all in the mafia, when of mm -hmm. course we're not, mm -hmm. um, that people might be afraid of us, but perhaps it's power. I'm not really sure. And mm -hmm. I don't know how we change that. I think it begs the bigger question for most of them. What does it mean to be Italian? Yeah. I don't know. Right. You know, I mean, if you ask somebody who was born in Italy that question, they would have a very different perspective on it mm -hmm. than we do here in America. And mm -hmm. even what does it mean to be Italian in, the, in, you know, the New York or the metropolitan region as opposed to Italians in Chicago right. or Italians in San Francisco or, 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 in, or, Alabama. Colorado, or in Alabama? <laughs> but what does it mean to be Italian? Yeah. It's a very, you know, we identify far too easily with food and with negative stereotypical mm -hmm. images. But that is how people, that, that's the closest thing they can um, find to define what it means mm -hmm. to be Italian. You, you're Italian-American, but you're not 100% Italian-American. No, no, I'm a product of a mixed marriage. Uh -huh. <laughs> the the two eyes, right? Yes, you're half I, Irish and right. half Italian. Yeah. They say the sons of Italy Middle married the, the daughters, daughters of Ireland. And my father's parents, of course, they were 100%, but they were mixed too. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was Bades and my grandfather was Napolitan, and that was, you know... Two different uh, countries. Two, two totally different countries. Exactly. And then, of course, my father married an Irish girl whose, who, whose father came from Scotland, so he was an Irish Scot, which is even more complicated than just being Irish. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, came from England, but she was Irish. But, you know, it was... It was not uncommon in, you know, either South Brooklyn or in Astoria, where I actually grew up, where half the kids were, they were either Irish or Italian. And I went to school with um, kids with names like Dominic O'Brien, mm -hmm. you know, and Pasquale O'Leary. Yeah. But that was, that was completely normal, normal. to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, the attraction, of course, was similar enough to be comfortable, different enough to be exotic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Staten Island is very similar to that, too. You have a lot of Italian and Irish marriages and children. And the interesting thing is now my brother, um, who is Italian, Irish, Scottish, English, married a girl from Brazil whose mm -hmm. father is from Portugal. So I have a nephew now who is Italian, Irish, Scottish, English, Brazilian, Portuguese, which <laughs> is very funny. But he doesn't understand any of this ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be another challenge for Italian Americans. Because with each generation, um, we are more likely to marry yeah. out of the Italian ethnicity. And we're, we're not keeping pieces of our culture to begin with uh, beyond food. And in some places, language or Italianish. You know, most mm -hmm. of us don't really speak Italian, and we're losing. Uh, what What does it really mean to be Italian? I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you, you mentioned language, and language is. We we had a little bit of a setback within the school systems recently with the suspension of the College Board. Mm -hmm. um, the College Board suspended the Advanced Placement Program in Italian, which was only three years old, and it was really sort of a shame because there had been growth from. From the first year to the second, there had mm -hmm. been like a three percent growth. But from the second year to the third, there was like a, close to an eighteen percent growth. And so, um, I think that's also going to be one of our challenges, and that might be something we can discuss. Yeah, I think we in the legislature, in the yeah. in the in the Italian American Legislators Conference, we are going to uh, focus on that. And I think part of the reason why we're losing Italian language in the schools is because Italians are not demanding it. You know, mm -hmm. the demand that children have to learn multiple languages actually is a good thing, you know? Mm -hmm. But we should be taking a page from Italy, we should be taking a page from the UK and from mm -hmm. France where they teach them multiple languages. Mm -hmm. Here, we've taken the approach that it's good to learn a second language in school, but it has to be Spanish or it has, now it's Chinese. Right. Which is fine. Quote, unquote, practical nothing, language. Right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But why restrict it to one mm -hmm. or two languages? You know, mm -hmm. we know that uh, young people uh, if they're educated and they learn to speak multiple languages, are, f are far better prepared for any career. Why would we restrict it to just one or two? Mm -hmm. But again, I, we have to fight for that. Why, Italians have just given yeah. that up as, as if, you know, well, we, we, we're not going to push for it. And we, we should. The idea that Italian is more than a language for opera mm -hmm. or more than a language for food, but that it's actually something also useful because actually Mayor Bloomberg's executive order of 120 about um, uh, city information to be available in other languages. Mm -hmm. One of the six languages is in fact Italian and mm -hmm. we were doing a study here at Calandra, two people here doing a study where we found that there are probably well over a million or close to a million if not over a million people who still speak Italian as a functional language. Right. It's a language they need within the five boroughs.
we definitely will have all of this and more to talk about um, down the road and, and to cap it all off mm -hmm. um, in June. Um, do we have dates for that yet? The first weekend in June. The 6th, 7th, 8th or something like yeah. that, right. And yeah. it'll be a Sunday and a mm -hmm. Monday. And a Monday. All right, and as soon as it's official, we will be broadcasting mm -hmm. it on a monthly basis here on the program. Oh, so good. I'm glad you were able to come by today. Um, it's not always easy negotiating through New York, New York's traffic in the middle of the afternoon. Not as bad as Rome. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> well, it can be. It depends. Uh, but we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. This spring, the Calandra Institute is pleased to announce two new conferences, Neapolitan Postcards, the Canzone Napoletana as Transnational Subject, March 19th through March 21st, and the Land of Our Return, Diasporic Encounters with Italy, April 23rd through 25th. For further details, times, and locations, visit our website, www.qc.cuny. Dot edu slash calandra. Next on italics, we go to Montclair State University for the celebration of the Teresa and Lawrence and Sarah Distinguished Professorship in Italian and Italian American Studies. <laughs> tonight to celebrate the fact that the exciting venture we entered into with Unico National as our partner has come to fruition. Montclair State now has the Teresa and Lawrence R. and Sarah Endowed Chair in Italian and Italian American Studies to support the university's major, minor, and teacher cert certification programs in Italian the Cocha Institute for the Italian Experience in America, our summer institutes in Siena and Sicily, and I just heard from a faculty member, we now have a new one in Florence, I think. There is no stopping us. <laughs> How many students study Italian at Montclair State? The answer is 550. <laughs> Montclair State University has the fourth largest Italian program in the United States, and we are determined to continue to build its size and its scholarly distinction and to welcome students not just from this region but from all over the country to study in what we hope will be the preeminent program in Italian studies in this country. Thank you everyone. Um, it is indeed an honor for my family and my parents and my grandparents to be able to do this uh, wonderful uh, endowment at Montclair State University. Um, my grandparents were, came from Italy. Um, my family grew up in Italian areas in Bergen County and I, I'm just so proud that I'm able to do this. I'm proud to stand before you as president of Unicom National, one of the major supporters and contributors toward this chair. In 1992, when Unico started our drive for Italian and Italian American study chairs throughout the country, who would have imagined we would have had a hand in completing five campaigns? Formed in 1922, Unico's first objective was scholarships and supporting youth. This chair is a natu natural offshoot of the continuation of these goals. You know, it's, it's fantastic to see the love that Italian-Americans have for, for Italy, even if they are second, third, fourth generation. 20 million Italian-American hearts which beat and which think and which love Italy. There's really no ocean between America and Italy, believe me. My wish is, to, is that uh, this chair can reach great goals and that, that Italian and Italian-American culture will continue to be appreciated, preserved, and promoted. Viva l'Italia! Grazie. Six years ago or so, when the Italian uh, American Heritage Commission was formed uh, by the state of New Jersey, it actually was the first commission to be formed in, in such a fashion. There are now about, I think, four of them around the country. One of our major goals uh, was about educating 
uh, the population of the state of New Jersey about the experience of the 1.5 million Italian Americans in this state and their immigrant experience. So having something like uh, uh, the INSERA uh, chair of Italian Italian American Studies uh, be brought to fruition is such an important, important uh, event, uh, not only uh, to Italian Americans, but to the state of New Jersey. For most of us here tonight, it's a celebration. To me, it's a graduation. <laughs> In October of 2000, then Unical President Bully Rocco called me and asked me if I could chair the Italian study chairs and fellowships of Unical National. Not familiar with its function, I'm recently retired. I said, sure, what's a big deal? You know, no big deal. A moment that changed my life forever. My first official visit was at Stony Brook University where Unico had started a chair. When I met Dr. Richard, Richard, very good, Frederick Gardepe, professor of Italian, who informed me that he was making a trip to Jersey and a visit to Montclair State University for a speech to the Italian department. I asked, does Montclair have an Italian department? I live a stone's throw away. I never heard anything about Italian in Montclair. So taken back, I had to, <coughs> nosy as I am, I had to be involved and I said, listen, I'll come to Jersey, I'll pick you up, we'll go to dinner, and then we'll go. Several meetings with faculty and then with President Cole, Unico and Montclair agreed to a chair in Italian. After our kickoff reception at Tulipana was on January 31, 2002, we had cash and pledges in the amount of 125000 My tenure ended with the July 2003 Unico Convention and the success up to this time raising a total of $346,776.85. Montclair State University is proud to proclaim the establishment of the Teresa Lawrence R. and Sarah Endowed Chair in Italian and Italian American Studies. The university gratefully acknowledges the generosity of the Insera family, Unico National, and all those who have helped make this chair possible. And your background, just so people can get an idea, you're in the supermarket, supermarket business, business, ShopRite supermarkets mm -hmm. in uh, Bergen County and um, Hudson County, and uh, family. And it's a family business. Family business. My grandparents started it in a little butcher shop in um, Garfield, New Jersey, uh -huh. and my father and his two brothers joined ShopRite in the early 50s, and uh, they grew the, the business to where we are today. And, and so what you've done is you've guaranteed in perpetuity Italian-American culture at Montclair. Well, I, just the whole New Jersey public university system is awesome. I mean, it's just, uh, it's come such a long way. And the, at Montclair, the Italian program is just so phenomenal. It just makes my heart proud to be an Italian-American. I'm absolutely uh, thrilled. It increases the profile for Italian and Italian-American studies here. I mean, to be a public university, to get a chair in Italian and Italian American studies in this environment, it's extraordinary. And the most important aspect uh, of this establishment is that uh, there is the, the grandchild of immigrants uh, who is yearning to have everyone else after him take up the culture, learn the culture, of uh, learn the language and, and the culture of his ancestors, and I'm, I'm so proud to be part of that. That's it for this issue of Italics, coming to you from Montclair State University. I'm Anthony Tambury. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. See you next time. Oh, yeah.